Hello and welcome. My name is Kim and I am with Calvert Woodley. And uh, I just wanted to say a really big thank you to everyone who has joined this uh, tasting. It's going to be really, really exciting. And it means a lot to um, from me and from Calvert Woodley to have your support. So today we are tasting with Howard Friedman. He is a uh, CW alum and um, he will be uh, leading us through kind of the initial part of this tasting. And then we also are going to be hearing from Roger Matthews, who is part of Wines from Wines of Galicia. Our other guest is um, Yuste, I think I said that right. Uh, he is the winemaker at Quinta de Casello and makes three of the wine, three, the three white wines we're going to be having tonight. And speaking of the wines, we have the tasting order is in the chat. So if you were just joining, I know that on Zoom when you just join it, you can't see previous chats. I'm going to paste it in there again. So the first white is going to be the um, the Tironia, and then we'll do the Quinta de Casello. It says uh, a lot of people here. And um, as you're joining, please make sure you are muted. And uh, the third wine will be the Finca Vanoa, and then the last one will be the red, the Truce Rivera del Duero. So um, that'll be our tasting order. And as we go throughout tonight, you know, we have uh, a lot of people on here, which is amazing. So what we're going to do is I'll be taking questions through the chat. Um, so as Howard and the group are all chatting and telling us about the wines, um, I will, you know, please drop your questions into the chat box and I'll, you know, interrupt at appropriate times to ask Howard all of your questions. And then at the very end, we can do more of a, you know, free for all style if you want to unmute and ask a question, but just to make sure we stay uh, on time and on task throughout, then we will um, be uh, using, utilizing the chat for that. So yes, uh, here to, to okay. in as well. Alrighty, so with that being said, um, I'm going to turn it over to Howard and I'll let you take it away. How is the screen sharing coming? Okay, great. Thank you guys. It's, um, can you all, all see and hear me? Uh, if not, <laughs> raise your hand, I guess is the best way to do that. <laughs> um, I have um, the great pleasure to do this, believe me. I, it's, I do a tour of Spain. And I um, haven't been there in two years because of what's going on. So it's nice to even do this vicariously. Uh, it's just a pleasure. Um, so without further ado, let me, let me just say that um, good afternoon to everybody in the U.S. And buenas noches, a Roger y Juste en España. So let's get started. Um, I'm going to hit share screen so you guys can see what I'm doing. Here we go. Okay, there we go. Okay, all set. So this is a journey across northern Spain from Galicia to Rivera del Duero, with me and with Roger Matthews, uh, the export director for the Wines from Galicia project, Jose Manuel Martinez Juste, the winemaker, and he shortens his long name in, in uh, American terms to Juste. Um, and I will talk about the Truce Roble from Rebel de Guero after Roger and uh, Jose are finished. Okay, so let's go to the next screen. Let's make sure I have this going properly. Okay, so here we are. Um, this is a map, of course, of the Iberian Peninsula. France here is here, of course. Africa here. Um, it's an interesting country. There is only one navigable river in this entire country. And it runs a very short distance. I hope you can see my pointer from, from uh, uh, Cadiz here to Sevilla. And the rest of the rivers in Spain are too shallow for commercial traffic. Up here, uh, we we're talking about the, we will, in, a, in a little while, talk about Rivera del Duero. It's along the Duero River, which is a very long river that starts here in Spain and goes all the way to the ocean through Portugal, but only in Portugal is it navigable. Um, so it's also true that here in Galicia, what you see around inside the red circle are, this is what's called an autonomous community. Okay, we'll get to that momentarily. But um, it was settled by the Celts instead of the, those who settled Spain, um, the rest of Spain. As a result, the facial features, etc. A lot of the, the people there, uh, hair color, hairstyles are different from the rest of Spain. The language is also different. Gallego is a separate language. 
with its own dictionary. It's not a dialect of Castellano. Roger, if you want me to stop for a second and, and translate to who state, by all means, I'll do that. Well, I, I don't think it's necessary. How would okay. it be? Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So um, the other languages are Castellano, which is spoken all over Spain. And there's also the Basque language, which is um, here in the up in the north along the coast in Bilbao and San Sebastian. In the far east and part of Spain is, uh, is uh, Barcelona, and all along the coast here is Catalonia, where Catalan is spoken. Um, those are the four languages, and as I said, they are different. Uh, it was during Franco's time uh, that the speaking of Basque was not allowed, and the teaching of Basque was not allowed. And in, in its beginning, Basque was not a written language, but since Franco has, has gone, the language is now, of course, written, and it's also taught in schools, so the language itself is coming back. Um, in this part of Spain, in Galicia, um, witches are a big part of the, the folklore, and at the end of dinner sometimes, they have a ceremony where they will um, ladle quemada uh, in little cups to everyone, and they will say an a, a, a incantation as they do it to uh, to word that to uh, keep the witches away from dinner. Galicia is actually part of Green Spain, which stretches whoop, stretches from here in the in the far west, the coast, along the north coast to all along to the to the um, Pyrenees Mountains. Here we have the Cant uh, Sierra Cantabria Mountains that stretch along the whole north coast. And what that means is that this area called the Espana Verde, Green Spain, is green because the weather that comes off the Bay of Biscay and the ocean drop the rain along the coast, but the mountains keep a lot of it from getting to the rest of Spain. So while Spain is mostly very dry and arid, the coast along the north and south are very wet. Um, and in fact, they're not cold at all. There are palm trees here in Galicia so the winters are not, even though there's snow in Spain, the winters are not harsh. Um, that's it, okay. Next slide. The food is my, the thing that keeps, uh, aside from the wines, the food is what keeps me coming back to Spain forever. I love seafood, mariscos. And the best seafood in Spain is so much better. No, you can't have that kind of food here in, the country, in this country. I think part of the enjoyment of the, of the food and the wine is actually being there, being in the setting that uh, where you're served the food in uh, a tapas bar or in a restaurant and the wines, the wineries. You have pulpo, octopus, mejillones, mussels, ostras, and an ego, a city on one of the um, rias. There is the, a street called Calle de los Ostras, where oysters are the main dish. The bajas, Raised plants, percebes, barnacles, gambas a la plancha, which is grilled shrimp with coarse salt, another one of my favorites in Spain, and beberechos, cockles. A lot are needed to make a meal, but it's well <laughs> worth it. They're very tiny clams. Bacalao is, of course, the ubiquitous fish that's served all over Spain. Okay, so now I'm going to a little primer on the wines from Galicia and Spain in general. Spain has seven. Looks like Howard's going to try to kind of get that fixed and realign. But um, in the meantime, Roger, did you have anything that you wanted to sort of? Uh, no, well, I, I can I can jump. take over from Howard looking at his at his his slide there. I mean, he, yes, he's he's making the point that that Spain is divided in these into these uh, autonomous communities. You know, so it's 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 like a, mm -hmm. a, a almost like a, a, a federal system. Uh, and Galicia is one of those uh, autonomies. So it, it, I think the point to make is it has a very much its, its own unique personal uh, identity. People will feel Galician first uh, and then Spanish afterwards. So it's, uh, and that's, I think, um, is strengthened also by the fact that they have their own language, uh, very, uh, very similar to, to, to Portuguese. Um, and then mm -hmm. in, the, in the same way that the country is divided into, uh, are you back, Howard? Um, the same way as the country is divided into these separate uh, communities or regions, um, when it comes to the wines, the same uh, applies. 
Uh, in the same way as the French have their appellaciones controle, in, a, in, in Spain we have something similar called a denominación de origen, or a DO, as you can see in, in, that, in that slide. Um, and in Galicia, uh, there are five DOs or appellations, if you like. Uh, and uh, Howard has highly highlighted in red uh, the, the, those uh, DOs that we're going to be tasting today. Uh, in, in total in Galicia, you can see that there's uh, five, Monterrey, Rios Baixas, Ribera Sacra, Ribero, and Valdoras. Um, we make wine actually in, in three of them. Monterey is the other one, but the wines that we're going to be tasting are Rios Baixas, which is famous for its uh, Alvarino wines, and Ribeiro, which is an interesting region because it's going through a, a renaissance, you could say. It's, it's really coming back from its past and, and rebuilding a, a future. Um, and then, if you like, in fo focusing even further uh, in, in a more, more uh, narrow way, Rios Baixas itself, as a, as, a, as a DO, has its own subzones. Uh, and how does it highlight El Rosal? Because El Rosal is the, the, the subzone of Rios Baixas where we make our wines. And each of these uh, subzones, they do have their own characteristics. Uh, and that's uh, what you in the wine. So it, there are things, if you, if you get into Alvarino wines and Rios Baixas, it's, it's good to do a little bit of investigation into these subzones because they, they do have their own uh, characteristics, which is, which is linked in, in part to their location and, and microclimates. And then continuing, well, it's true. I mean, I think Howard wanted to help people um, find their way around a bottle of wine from the region. Uh, and you'll quite often see uh, in big bold letters, the word Alvarino on the front label of a bottle. Uh, that is put there to tell people not just that it's made from Alvarino, but it's actually 100% Alvarino. You can only put Alvarino on the front label. All of this is regulated by um, you know, the, the, the laws that the, the, the DO set for their winemakers. Uh, and one of those is Alvarino on a front lane label can only be applied if the wine is actually 100% Alvarino. Um, that's good to know uh, because if it's not on the front label, uh, it will tell you that it's a, it's a, a coupage, it's a, it's a, it's a blend. Uh, and those are wines which are also very interesting. Um, they, they may not be so well known as the Alvarino's 100%, but the blends are, are, are well worth uh, taking notice of. And we'll be tasting one. Quinta de Cusero is a blend. Uh, and even that has its own um, regulations because there are certain blends which each region or subzone uh, will, 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 will have as their own. Uh, in the case of, um, of Rosal, uh, our blend is, is uh, principally um, Alvarino. It, it can be 70% uh, as part of a total blend. In the case of the wine we are tasting, Quinta de Cusero is actually 90%. But these are blends allow you to introduce other indigenous varieties which are interesting too. But there, there's, there, there are others um, which are worth uh, taking a look at. Uh, in the case of Quinta de Cusero, the other two grapes are, are Lureiro, uh, which has a sort of a bay-like quality and Caño Blanco. So they will go into the blend. That, that is information you will only see if you turn the bottle around and look on the back label, uh, uh, by the way. Uh, and then he goes on to the other grades. There you can see Godeo, Trejitura, uh, Torontes, Loreira, Caño Blanco. These are the other grapes which are generally used in, in blends. Uh, and then also people uh, don't always realize this, but we have these red uh, varieties too and red wines which are growing in popularity. And then these other points, I think we'll see in my, in my presentation, the, the, the growing system, the trellising system, particularly the, uh, the Pogla Pogla system, which is a way of raising the vines up in the air above the ground to protect them from um, fungus attacks. Uh, how are you back on? Can, you, can anybody yeah, hear me? Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. Carry on. Much better. We do have one question in the chat just before we move on. What does DO stand for? I got it. I got it, Roger. Denomination okay. origin. Just like in, in France, you have Bordeaux wines, and each of the, you have the Bordeaux is the major designation, but within Bordeaux, you have Saint Emilion, you have Saint Estep, you have, you have Saint Joseph, you have Pomerol. Those would be the DOs, the name of a delimited region within the, uh, within the area of production. And each of those, each of those has a. Um, now that I'm back on here, um, each of those has a, has a regulatory council, 
Consejo Regulador. And in that council is someone from uh, the growers, someone representing the growers, at least one grower. You have someone from, from the Spanish government. You have someone from the, um, the EU and trade council, et cetera, some other people. And they decide which grapes can be planted in that region, how many kilos of grapes you can harvest in a year, whether you can water the grapes or not, and what you need to be able to call your wine Alvarino or um, Rioja or whatever else. And so you are awarded a, a stamp, which goes on the back label of any wine from Spain with a particular um, logo for each of the councils, okay? So now we're now back here. In, um, in Galicia and in the rest of Spain, there are three ways of growing, growing grapes. There's Paldera, which is the normal uh, grow that you see in, in California and France on the wires, and Basso, which is the head pruned vines. They look like, uh, Basso is a goblet, and so they look like a little glass. And Paradelus, which normally you won't see anywhere but in, in uh, Galicia and, and uh, on the north coast, because there's so much rain that unless they did it on Paradelus, there's no way to get the grapes dry. So there'll be a lot of rot. So they use the they use the pergolas to allow the grapes to hang down and to dry out with uh, the winds that blow through them. The topography, the geology, the climate, the proximity to the ocean, the cuisine, all these things play a large role in a variety of grapes grown. And until recently, the Spanish growing laws for all the dios did not allow what vineyards to be irrigated. Only you could put, when you put the, um, a shoot that you planted in the ground, you could, you could water it for two years. And after that, you couldn't. Just to get it started, you could water it, and then it had to survive on, it, on the rain, okay? Climate change, of course, has affected that particular issue. Okay, so here we are. Um, uh, right after I finish this, Roger and, uh, Tuesday, we'll take over. If your white wines are in the refrigerator, take them out and open them up so that they're not ice cold um, now. And at the same time, put the red wine in the refrigerator, opened, so that it can cool off from in your house. But here we have the Dio's. This one is uh, Ribeiro de Uya. Here we have uh, Saunes, is here. Suerte Mayor is here. Rosal is here, and Condado de Tea is here. So you can see that each of the regions has a certain uh, climate area. This one is farther inland and along the river. This one is right on the coast, uh, but a little north. This one is at the, at, at the um, headwater, headwaters of the uh, Rio de Vigo, and, and uh, Rosal and Tea. Tea are the two, these two, I'm gonna switch to the next, uh, well, let's before I do that, let's take a look over here. Here is again the map of Galicia. You have in the green area a Rosal, which is surrounded by the red circle. That's where the wines are coming from today. And you have Rio, which is uh, where the, the other region, the other DO, where the Finca Vignola is coming from. So both of these DOs are along a river called the Mino River. It divides Portugal down here from Spain. Okay, and here are the other DOs that that uh, Roger was talking about: Monterrey, Ribeira Sacra, Valdeoras, um, etc. Okay, everybody clear on that? Okay, next slide. I yes, the tasting. Can I jump in with a question before we get sure. into? Sure. Um, there was a question from Bill, and he says, are the Alvarino wines from neighboring Portugal similar to the wines from Galicia? Well, good question. Like any other um, agricultural product, if you grow that product in a different soil, different climate, different viticulturist producing the vine, you know, growing the grapes, it will be different. If you grow an apple in, in Maryland, it's going to taste different than if you grow it in Georgia. Same thing is true here. Um, I guess Roger, I was trying to figure this, so I didn't, I didn't hear what Roger had said. In Orosal and 
come down over to Tea. Let me do it back a bit. Um, I thought I had um, the, um, I guess not. Uh, give me one second here. Ah, the Valvasones, which is here, produces mostly single varietal grapes, meaning Albarino. Um, Candada de Tea, which is down here in the south, is the farthest inland and one of the most southern. The wine must have at least 70% Albarino and Trishadura in a blend. Whatever else they put into it is okay, but it must at least those two grapes, or it cannot say uh, Tea on the front label. Okay, in a Rosal, if um, it's to say Rosal on the front label, as Quinta Cosedo does, it must have 70% Albarino and the other, and mixed with the Loreiro. That's the hardest word in Spanish I've ever had to pronounce. Loreiro. Um, the rest of it can be what is uh, what it, you know, whatever else they grow, but it has to have that at least. Okay. All right, uh, I think that's the end of what I have. Roger and Huste, take it away. Right, well, um, chair. I'll, 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 I'll get going. Right, okay, well, there, I've got two short PowerPoint presentations uh, to go through, for, for one for each of the wineries, uh, and I'll try and make these, uh, you know, brief, so we can get on to the wines. But this is a good place to start, because if you have those two bottles from of uh, Rosal, Rios Baixas, um, by, by you, you'll see on the front label of both uh, two trees. Uh, on the label, they look quite small. Uh, in real life, they're, they're much bigger. I mean, you're, you know, you probably get up to about here if you're standing next to one of them. So they're enormous. Uh, they're about 250 years old. They've been a long time uh, there uh, in, our, in our winery, in our vineyard. And they are the, the symbol, the symbol you could like, you can say of, of Quinta Cusello. Uh, and we show them on, on, the, on the front labels of, of all of the wines that we make. Um, how we was talking about Rosal, well, you know, they say it, uh, a picture paints a thousand words. Here it, it, it is. This, this is Rosal. This, this little sort of cul-de-sac here, uh, it's about 1,200 acres in all, so not very big, bordered, as how it was shown on the map, by the Mino River here. This is Portugal. And this is, is looking towards the US. This is the Atlantic Ocean. Um, behind this hill, or, or mountain, I should say, a Tecla, which actually has a, 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 a prehistoric um, uh, remains on the, on the, on the summit, uh, which is the, 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 the other boundary. So, so Rosal, sheltered in a way from the, the weather that comes over from the Atlantic, uh, is, is bordered by the, the River Mino, Portugal, the Atlantic, and then sheltered by high hills uh, to create a sort of a quite a benign microclimate where the conditions are, are, are very favorable for, for, the, for the grapes that we grow. So that's the image you need to keep in mind uh, to have a, a, an idea of Brussel, where, where these wines come from. Um, I like to kick off with the history because it is interesting. I could go back to the Cistercian months and the 12th century, but we take it up uh, with this date, 1864, which is when wine starts to be made in the winery where we are still today, Quinta Cosello. It actually makes the winery one of the oldest in, in Rios Baixas, the, the second oldest historically, and it belonged to a, a family, this uh, Vicente fam family, um, up until 2013 when Justi, our winemaker, and uh, a couple of friends uh, bought the winery from the, the family. This, this was from the great-grandchildren of the founder, uh, and started the, the, the modern phase of, of, of Quinta Costello. You can see this door here, this black door, and there's this front uh, of a building. That's from, you know, the early days of photography. Here it is again, in a photograph that we took uh, not so long ago. So as you can see, not very much has changed in, in, in the architecture, but, uh, but this is now uh, the Quinta de Costello winery uh, as of today. And that's an even better picture uh, because this goes uh, going back in time. What you see here is a, a five acre site 
bordered by a wall uh, and a, a river, the, the last tributary into the Minho before it gets to the Atlantic. And this goes back to Cistercian times. Uh, that were, were in, when the, the, the monks uh, uh, were the founders of this, 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 this farm, it was actually, first of all, a farm. But in the 12th century, they built this outer wall, which is still the boundary of what um, then became the winery 150 years ago. And, and very little has changed. And, and what we have here is one site. We have another a bit further up here. And you have uh, uh, Alborino and, and Caño Blanco and Loreiro, all that we need to make the blend Quinta de Gustelo on, on, on the same site. Uh, the Alborino grapes or vines about, about 30 years old. And, uh, and a soil being ne ne near the river, which is have quite a high loam content, some, some pebbles, some stones, but mainly sort of an, an alluvial soil. And, and here are those two trees that you saw before in the previous photograph. From, uh, from They're looking a bit smaller now from, from high up. Uh, and this just gives you some more pictures to give you an idea of the ambiente, the, the atmosphere. We know we have a, a visit to the wine and people come and, and, and relax. You can see that the, the pergola system that we use is how to explain to keep the, the vines protected from mist. You see the, this, um, this last uh, river, the Caballas, which is uh, the, the, one of the borders of the, the vineyard and, and leads to the Minho and then to the Atlantic. And you see this green cover. So it's, it's like a garden because we don't use any herbicides. Uh, Hosti likes to keep the soil clean and, and healthy and alive. Uh, so we use a, a green cover, grass, that is to say, to, to retain moisture in the soil and, and to keep it healthy. Um, this is a quick shot just to, again to show the, the, the pergola system, which is very symbolic, very typical of, of the region. You can see how high they are. It actually makes uh, picking quite, quite difficult. You need to have long arms or something to stand on. And all the grapes are picked by hand, not by by, by a, a mix of people. They, 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 funnily enough, in, in other parts of Spain, you quite often get immigrant people coming in to do the picking these days from East, East Europe or North Africa. In Galicia, it's still very much picked by Galicians. Uh, I think people are you know, tend to to be uh, you know, more in tune with their, 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 their own local customs and continuing the traditions perhaps than in other, other parts. Picked by hand into these small uh, crates. As you can see from the photograph, their grapes don't have to go very far to get to the wine. It's literally just around the corner. Um, uh, sorted on a table, this is a, a still, but actually when it's working, it's actually vibrating. You wouldn't actually see those uh, clusters. So I'm so, so focused there because it's a vibrating table. We then de-stem the clusters. Um, they go into a cold soak, then pressed in a pneumatic press. And then you must have seen these pictures before, so stainless steel vats uh, where they um, ferment after, after it's been settled and, and racked. Um, these are, uh, are just some of the, the awards to give you an idea of you know, the, 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 you know, our success in wine competitions. We get a lot of uh, ratings and, and points and, and medals. Uh, which uh, help, you know, uh, when it comes to, to, to marketing. But I, I hope the wines speak for themselves and uh, when you when you come to taste them. And that's just the the, the, the lineup just to give you an idea of uh, you know the, the uh, you know what, what we have in terms of uh, the complete selection. I'll just switch over to the other presentation. And now we are we're going uh, across uh, Galicia. Uh, it's kind of following the track of, of the, the Nemino River, but now to Ribeiro. Um, and this is also another of those pictures that, that, that where it tells a, 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 a story. You can probably see from, the, from here that it has the appearance of something that has suddenly emerged from the, the hillside. This is the Finca uh, Vineyard. It's the single vineyard that we use to make the wine that will taste last, uh, the Finca Vineyard wine. And uh, what we have done here is basically, uh, uh, it's almost like a, a work of uh, archeology span excavation. We have recovered uh, a, a vineyard that had been lost because Ribeiro has a history with its ups and downs. And there was a, there was a time at the beginning of, of, of the century and then in post-war when there was a lot of um, uh, reduction in, in uh, wine production and, and vineyards were, were lost. And, and in this part of the world with uh, eucalyptus trees, Ripe. It doesn't take long for, for, for the, the plant, the rest of the other uh, plants, trees and such like to take over and, and, and replace a, a vineyard. Um, but as part of this renaissance uh, that I, I mentioned at the very beginning, um, this desire now to sort of recover a, a lost heritage, um, 
here we are amongst the pioneers in, in that work. 20 years ago, Pusti and, and his colleagues came and reclaimed this vineyard by, by literally taking off the, the, the trees, the eucalyptus trees, uncovering the topsoil and getting down to the original uh, site of, of, a, of, a of a terraced uh, a vineyard. These terraces have been very typical of um, uh, vineyards in, in this part of the, the world because uh, we're talking about a, a region based on, on, on three uh, river valleys. Um, the, 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 the Avia, the Minya that we've seen before, and the Noya. So as you can see with these, with these valleys, the, 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 it's, 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 the tendency is to have vineyards on, on slopes uh, on, on, the, on the, the side of each valley. This particular valley the, 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 um, that we have here, the Avia, is, is um, I would say perhaps the, the, the most important. Another map just to sort of give us your location. We're at, we are here, that picture that you saw at the beginning is actually on this uh, bank here, which, which is actually uh, south facing, both a, a southeast and a, and a southwest uh, surface. So it's very well located when it comes to solar orientation. Yeah, that just is a put at, at the top end of this Avia Valley that I showed before. This guy goes to a, a picture of, of, uh, taken at the very beginning of this, this cover, recovery work. When we were clearing away the trees in the top soil, we literally cover, uncovered the remains, perhaps a hundred years old, of these old stone walls, or solcalcos, um, which we tried to recover as much as we could. And here's one of the ones that we, we did. There's a, there's a bit of reconstruction, but basically, we have retained the same stone walls that we discovered when uncovering the original vineyard. And this is, is taken high up looking south. We're looking right down the Avia Valley here, due south. But as you can see, with slopes on the southeast and the southwest. So if you go all the way down this river, you can actually drive up on the road. We have a town called River Davia and the Mino River uh, heading um, uh, 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 west and, and to, the, to, the, to the Atlantic. So that is at the top of the end of the, of the vineyard, looking due south, right down the, the Avia Valley, the heart of this region, Ribeiro. Um, here, showing a little bit more of the, the, the planting at the early days. Um, it's it's, it's it valued uh, Ribeiro quite uh, for a number of reasons, the locations, the sloping vineyards, the soil types too. We have uh, some of this strange uh, material called sabrable, which is decomposed granite. Uh, it, it looks like a rock, but it's a rock which you can crumble with your hand. You make you feel like Superman, you know, crushing a rock with your hand. Uh, and also schist, which is like slate, some clay, but a lot of a, a high mineral content, which I think you'll find in the wine. The minerality of the Ribeiro wines is, is quite notable, and it has its basis in, you know, in, in the soil content of, of, of the, the vineyards. Here is a, is, a, is a picture looking up the slope, and it, it is quite a, quite a slope. Um, uh, I have to consult my note, because I'm always forgetting that, that I've made a note, for, so we have it in, in feet. It's at 590 feet at the, at the lowest point, and goes up to 1,250 feet at the highest point. So in a vineyard, you have both a play with um, uh, altitude, and also soil type, and also great varieties because we have this uh, particular variety indigenous to Ribeiro called, called, called Treixadura, a variety that's worth remembering because it's the, it's the build, main building block of these wines, but also Godello, Alborino, and Lureiro. So the wine is, is made, it's blended, if you like, in the vineyard. We, we can judge you know, the grapes by the soil content, the altitude and the variety, and, and, and create a wine that, it, that although it's a, a blend, um, is, is, is come from the same vineyard. Uh, and that also, I think, makes it interesting. It's not being created with uh, uh, grapes from different parts. It's all from the same uh, location. But with this uh, uh, arrangement, we have these other uh, things we can play with in the wine. Altitude, soil type, and, and, uh, and a, a mix of varieties. And, and I think it is important to understand how important it is to, to note uh, blends. It's, it's, you know, the, the, the most interesting wines from Galicia are not necessarily monovarato, whether that's Alberino, Treixador or, or, or Godello. They're quite often like Finca Vineyard blends uh, using other indigenous grapes. Um, again, picked by hand, but, uh, but now on, on a trellis, we don't have the pergola system in, in Ribeiro. It's, it's all um, more convenient on these, on these terraces. 
but the actual wine making, and I can move quick through, is very similar. I pick by hand, uh, sorted on the table, a whole cluster is then destemmed, crushed, and into to stainless steel vats where they are kept um, on lees. That's another uh, aspect of the wines which is important. We, we ferment, but then with the wines are not uh, bottled uh, immediately. We, we, Jose, I would say, is an expert in, in, in allowing uh, uh, f uh, the contact with yeast, uh, or at least contact, to also create an extra dimension for the wines. We use a system of inert gas injected into the, the tanks to gently stir these leaves perhaps once a week. But this play of, of, of leaves, fine leaves, uh, during the time in, in tank is, is an area which um, uh, Hust is, I think, rec recognized uh, in, in Galicia as an expert and, and creates this dimension. Both Toronia, Quinta de Gostello, and Finca Vignor actually uh, uh, kept on leaves for six months. Um, before before we bottle, but with very very gentle stirring system, not a not anything um, to, to heavy. So that the, the, the play of, of leaves with the wine is very discreet and, and, and very subtle. And all this um, controlled by his iPhone. <laughs> he, he can because it's temperature controlled fermentation. But Husty knows what's going on in the in the winery when he's in in bed at night because he just has it on a on a on a screen. So traditional um, aspects, but also quite modern ones too. Uh, in in the um, in the winemaking, right? That that that's it from from me. We can I I can we can now go over to Huste Huste. Hey. Hey, Hi, uh, Roger. La, la Cata, si. Yeah, sorry, Kim. Kim. Oh, it's okay. I just wanted to make sure that we spend time tasting each wine as well. I know you're probably yeah. about to get into that, but um, and that's what uh Huste is gonna go through. But I just wanted to let everyone know that we are going to. You know, be doing kind of a tasting in tandem with talking. So definitely pour your wine. We're going to start off with the Taronia, um, just so that you know we're all ready to go. All right, take it away. And let me also add, there was a question about what are the leaves. And the leaves are what the as the wine ferments, there are um, uh, deposits that are created that fall to the bottom of the tank. And in order for the wine to be clean. When, it cut, when it's put in a bottle, those leaves, which are, which are particles of skin and very, very tiny things that are left over from fermentation, um, that need to be clarified. So that's what they are. The more contact the wine has with the leaves, the more it gains from, the, from all the, that the grape has to offer the juice. Remember that all grape juice is white. It is the skins that give the color to the wines and a lot of the flavor. Okay, so the longer you keep it on the skin, the longer you keep it in contact with the detritus from 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 fermentation called the leaves, the more flavor you get in the wine. Okay, all right. Okay. Um, where's Huste? I I, I I will just act as translator here. Huste um, will speak in Spanish and and I'll translate. Ante todo, darles las gracias por la paciencia y por darnos la oportunidad de presentar los, los, nuestros vinos. Eh, esperamos a la altura de la, de la presentación y de, los, de las personas que han intervenido antes para ser capaces de trasladar un poco nuestro trabajo. Ok, you just like to, uh, Jose, we just like to thank you all for your patience, for, for taking your time to, to join us, and he hopes that uh, his description of the wines will be uh, of the uh, same level as the, the previous presentation. So, um, uh, and uh, that you'll, you know, enjoy the experience. Okay, and... Me, discul me disculpo por no poder eh, comunicarme en, en inglés con ustedes, pero me consta que Roger lo hará magníficamente en la traducción, como, como siempre. Well, it's just uh, saying, be, uh, sorry, it has to be through an interpreter, but, um, you know, we, we, we'll, we'll manage. Eh, durante todo, antes de proceder a la cata de los vinos, eh, introducir un pequeño dato sobre la climatología de la cosecha 2019. Right, he's going to uh, give you a brief description first of all of the uh, vintage, 2019 vintage. Fue un año que estuvo marcado fundamentalmente por un frío lluvioso y un agosto lluvioso, por lo cual... Mm, yes, it was, it was a, a, a vintage that was marked by quite a lot of uh, rain. Uh, including uh, in August. Eh, y con un mes de julio muy cálido hasta septiembre, lo cual hizo que la maduración 
eh, fuera un tanto irregular y un poco eh, de forma desigual en las distintas parcelas. Yes, and, then, and that uh, rain in August actually followed a, a very warm July and then a, a warm September. So it was a, a, a year where the, the ripening of the grape was a, a little bit irregular. Estas lluvias ocasionaron una caída en la producción por hectárea de las parcelas, pero también nos ayudaron a reducir los rendimientos, lo que ayudó a concentrar la uva y a conseguir una muy buena uva para la elaboración de estos vinos del 2015. Okay, well, because of these factors, there was uh, actually lower yields, less production uh, from the vineyards uh, in 2019, but that did allow us to, to concentrate Uh, the production and it, it did uh, raise the quality. So it's often the case in years when there's less production, you actually see a, a, a corresponding increase uh, in, in the quality because you know there's less less great but of higher higher quality. Después de esta breve introducción a lo que fue la cosecha en lo climático del 19 eh, y antes de empezar con el primer vino con Tronia, me gustaría trasladar que cualquier pregunta, cualquier duda, o cualquier eh, cuestión que se quiera tratar, que simplemente se traslade y a ver si somos capaces de eh, resolverla eh, en la medida de, lo, de nuestros conocimientos. Ok, and he just made the point before he starts the actual tasting. Any questions that um, you have, just uh, let us let, ask and we will do our best to, to answer any, any queries as, as we go along. Bueno, lo primero que haremos con este Turonia es ver la intensidad colorante que tiene. En un vino blanco es raro escuchar hablar sobre la intensidad colorante de un vino, pero realmente es un dato importante. Well, first of all, we let's look at the, the color. I mean, with, with white wines, it's not uh, so um, typical to, to talk about intensity of color, but it is uh, an important factor in our wines. We should uh, look at first at the, at the, color, the showing color. Si observamos, vemos que tiene un hermoso color amarillo verdoso. Esto And viene it... dado con una ligera intensidad. Esto viene dado por el proceso de maceración de la uva antes de su fermentación en frío, lo cual nos va a Bobby left. Uh -huh. Bobby left. Yeah, I don't see her. Oh. Hello. Perdón. Ah, yeah. oh, back. Uh, sorry, okay, no, and you, we, if you're looking at Toronia, you'll see it has sort of a, a, a yellowy green color, very uh, bright. Um, and this is a, a result of the, the, the cold maceration that we do prior to the pressing. That, that two hours or so in the press allows to extract a, a, enough from the grape skins to give the wine this, 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 this distinct color that it has. It's a, a, sort of a, a yellowy green tinge. Roger, let me see. Let me stop a second and say, to look at the color of any wine, the best way to do that is to look through the glass onto a piece of white paper. Okay, that's how you would judge, for instance, a diamond. You can't hold the diamond up to the light and see the color of the diamond. In order to see the color of the wine, you, what I do is hold the glass over a sheet of white paper or white, whatever it is, something white, and look through the glass at the wine. And you can then see the real color of the wine, okay? I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm through. Efectivamente, cuando hablamos de intensidad colorante en un vino blanco, a veces se habla como algo que va en contra de la calidad. Pero lo que, eh, lo que importa realmente no es la intensidad, sino el brillo y lo acerado que está el vino. Y este yeah. vino no tiene ningún color caído, está verde y está acerado. Tiene muy buen brillo. Yeah. Quiere decir que el vino está oxidado. Yes. La, well, el, el tono de color que tiene es por esa maceración en frío y no por efecto de la oxidación. Yes, you have to be a bit careful when judging white wines by color, because sometimes wines, white wines can be very. Um, dense in color and it, it's not always a, a good sign because if that comes from oxidation which it quite often does you know the, the wine might not be uh, such an attractive wine as it appears in, in the glass um with our wines uh, just that this this uh this this um color which is purely from skin contact 
nothing to do with anything else. So it has this, this lighter color, and then this uh, uh, effect of, of, of brightness, this, you know, that, that, which you can see in a, almost like a steely quality to the color. Uh, and that's what we look for in, in the glass with our wines. So, you know, that this brilliancy, this brightness, this, this clarity, and then this, the, these, uh, these genuine tinges that come from the, the, the grape itself. So, uh, yeah, and, and, that, and not from oxidation. Eh, después de haber analizado el color del vino, vamos a analizar la intensidad aromática que tiene el vino a copa parada. Sin mover la copa, simplemente vamos a olfatear el vino para que nos dé la intensidad y el, y el aroma principal que tiene el vino en copa parada. Ok, and first of all, he's going to now taste it, uh, um, show the wine on the nose, but without uh, agitating the glass. The first uh, um, contact with the nose is with a still glass to, to get the first uh, um, contact, that, that first uh, experience of what, of what it's showing. Aquí podemos apreciar que estamos ante un vino que tiene una intensidad aromática alta y que tiene un aroma frutal. And you can just tell straight away, even with the glass still, that it has a, a it is an aromatic wine with a, an intense nose and, it, and it's showing a, a fruit, a, a fruity nose. Ahora pasaremos a mover la copa para percibir todo el matiz y la pared aromática que realmente tiene el vino y ser capaces o tratar de ser capaces de distinguir cuáles son las frutas que predominan en el aroma de este vino. And now stirring the glass and then um, uh, uh, putting it to the, to the nose, we can try and identify what those fruit aromas actually are. Y el primer aroma que podemos detectar son aromas de frutas de hueso, cito, eh, ciruelas, melocotones. And the first thing that comes uh, to, to, uh, to mind are stone fruits, um, peach uh, and white plum. Y también notamos una, eh, unas notas cítricas muy intensas en el fondo, como eh, ensortijando el resto de estos aromas frutales. And, and then a very strong citric component which underpins the, the, the other aromas. So that, that's also very typical of the wines from this region, the, cit the citric quality. Los prescriptores aromáticos que, con los que se suele relacionar el vino son eh, las, las frutas de hueso, la ciruela y el melocotón y también con estas notas cítricas. Por lo que estamos ante un albariño que tiene todos los atributos aromáticos de un albariño que ha madurado bien. Nosotros, todos nuestros miedos están en pérgola, en las fincas de Rosal. Ok, y él está diciendo estas características, la the, the, the fruta the, the, the peach, la the, the, the plum y el cítric aspecto, es muy típico de lo que él llamaría un buen genuino, un buen clásico uh, albariño, y los albariños made from vineyards which are, are, are healthy as we have with the pergola system in, in our vineyard. So these, these are qualities that you should be looking for, I suppose, when you, when you open a bottle of Albarino. Una vez que ya hemos eh, olfateado el vino y hemos percibido toda la paleta aromática que el vino tiene, vamos a pasar a eh, degustar el vino y a ver eh, primero el aroma de boca que tiene el vino y luego el resto de atributos y sensaciones que nos transmite el vino en boca. Ok, so after uh, trying the wine on the nose, we're now going to taste it and see all the, the qualities in the mouth, both with the initial taste and then the other sensations that come with this. Y el vino en boca tiene una muy buena entrada, una entrada que aparece un poco dulzona, el aroma en boca es eh, muy envolvente, nos recuerda otra vez a esas frutas de hueso, incluso un poquito más maduras, podemos hablar de frutas de hueso en almíbar, y eh, luego empieza a mostrar un, una buena acidez que le transfiere un frescor muy interesante que lo mantiene en boca durante mucho tiempo. Y tiene una nota salada, con una mineralidad salada, que hace que el vino eh, tenga un volumen y una cremosidad en boca que eh, lo hace muy, muy interesante y que eh, nos transmite unas sensaciones muy eh, placenteras. Yes. 
So, it, so when you describe it, when you first have it in the mouth, the, 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 it's a good entry. It, it fills the, 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 the palate. You get initially these same uh, sensations in the mouth as you find on the nose, the, the stone fruit, the citric quality. But then after that, you'll find the, the, the mineral notes and then some of the, the acidity uh, that, that we look for, the, the freshness. And then that leads to a sort of a salinity too that comes at, at the very end on a long finish. So there's a lot to experience and, in, and enjoy uh, from the wine in, in the mouth. That, that's a sequence of effects. Eh, es un vino que tiene también una, gran, una nota grasa muy interesante en boca y que equilibra eh, la parte dulce de entrada con la parte ácida que le da frescor, confiriéndole a todo el vino un grandísimo equilibrio que lo mantiene y lo hace muy persistente en boca. Right, I mean, at the beginning here, I forget, there's a, there's a bit of sweetness on, on the entry, and then you get this grasa, which is, 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 is uh, it translates as, as fat, but you know, you know what I mean? It's, it's this more um, corpulent, uh, um, uh, yes, a, 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 a greasy uh, or fatty quality that, that comes uh, afterwards to create the, 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 the balance and, and the acidity too. Yeah. We need to hurry up. Oh, yes, okay, okay. I to be a... A, uh, a wet blanket on this, but we're on the first line. We got the two whites and then the red. Okay. And we're almost at five o'clock. So okay. <laughs> okay. 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 Como una recomendación gastronómica, iremos más, un poquito más rápido con los otros vinos porque era un poco para eh, dar los tiempos de, de, de cata que deberíamos eh, sí. llevar en cada vino para poder degustarlos eh, de la forma más adecuada posible. Ok. Eh, este vino, una, de, una recomendación gastronómica, todos estos vinos que vamos a degustar se, se, se encajan perfectamente con los mariscos y con el pescado, pero en el caso de, de Turonia, yo lo recomendaría con marisco de concha eh, al natural, unas almejas al natural o unas ostras al natural, o con cualquier mar, marisco de concha. All the wines pair very well with, with seafood, but this particular one, uh, Turonia, he would talk about uh, pairing it with, with a, a shellfish, like, like, like mussels uh, and, and oysters, which have a, have a shell. Okay, we, we're now moving to the to the blend, the Toronio 100% Albarino, now Quinta de Cusello, uh, the, the blend. Si el anterior vino era un 100% Albarino, ahora vamos a degustar el Quinta de Cusello, que es un rosal, que es el 90% Albarino, un 5% Caño Blanco y un 5% eh, Lourenio. Right, so of course they're making the point on the front label now, instead of Albarino, we see the word rosal which means it is a, a, a blend, an authorized blend from the Rosal um, uh, uh, region. And in this case, we're talking about 90% Albarino, 5% Lurero, and 5% Caño Blanco. Eh, es el vino típico de la zona del Rosal, y como vemos, tiene también un color amarillo verdoso, muy acerado, muy brillante, muy, eh, muy atractivo. So, and in a similar way to Toronia, you see this like, yellowy green, uh, uh, hints to, to the color, uh, sort of a bit of ste a steely quality to it, and very bright and very clean. Aromáticamente estamos eh, a un vino de una alta intensidad aromática, donde cambia eh, eh, el aroma principal del vino y aparece un aroma, un aroma floral muy intenso. Right. Now, again, you are very intense uh, on the nose, but you'll notice with Quinta de Cosello, there's now a floral aspect to those aromas. And now stir, stir in the glass. Y cuando movemos el vino salen todas esas notas florales, flores blancas, rosas, también alguna nota de laurel. Las notas florales vienen de la variedad Caillo, que es una variedad que confiere notas muy florales a los vinos. La nota vegetal de laurel o la variedad laurel, de laurel, y luego tiene toda la 
la paleta de notas de ciruela, melocotón en almíbar ya directamente en nariz y eh, la nota de cítrica que ya tenía el anterior vino. Es un vino muy potente con una altísima intensidad y que incluso la nota aromática, además de ser floral, es una nota dulzona ya en nariz. Que nos habla ya de un vino de muy buena madurez. Okay, so the, the, those aspects come from the blend. The, the, the floral notes is a, is a feature of the Caño uh, grape. There's a little bit of a, almost like a, a bay quality, which is an aspect of Lurero. And then you have the stone fruits uh, and the citric qualities that we noticed in Tironia before coming from the Albarino. A very intense uh, nose, but now with these added dimensions from the, the two other varieties. Y el aroma en, en boca es franco, salen esas notas florales y la entrada es una entrada con muy fresca. Es una entrada muy fresca que según va abriendo el vino en boca va mostrando una buena salinidad, va mostrando unas notas, una grasa, un equilibrio importantísimo que eh, inunda toda la boca. Es un vino muy aterciopelado en boca y, y utilizo el término aterciopelado, que utiliza más sentitos pero que este vino sí tiene esa redondez y esa salinidad y la grasa de, de, de la maloproteína de crianza sobre días se nota tanto en el anterior vino como esto, dando esa grasa y esa sensación dulzona que el vino tiene, que no viene de los azúcares, sino que viene de ese trabajo en líneas. Es un vino muy persistente y vuelve a ser un vino con una mineralidad, con una salinidad muy importante que nos hace salivar y que mantiene el vino en el paladar durante... So it's a similar characteristics as before, but just emphasizing once again this 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 mouth feel, the, 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 the almost like a a velvety feel that comes from the lees contact uh, and fills the mouth. It's a very interesting wine in the in, in the mouth, freshness to begin with, but then a, this this lees feel in the mouth and and a, and a long finish, uh, a wine which really fills the palate with a, with a lot of sensations. Eh, la recomendación gastronómica, siempre estos vinos maridan fenomenalmente con pescados, con, con mariscos, eh, pero a mí este me, ahora mismo me lleva pues, con unas cigalas, con unos camarones, incluso a una langosta. Las cigalas y los camarones cocidos y la langosta también cocida. ¿no? Esa salinidad me llamaría mucho a este, a este bocado, ¿no? ahora mismo, aunque marida bien con cualquier tipo de pescado. Well, this would go with any kind of seafood and fish, but with this, this salinity, um, uh, Jose thinks it goes particularly well with, with, with lobster, some of these uh, lobster uh, dishes, uh, and also uh, the, the, um, the, the langoustines uh, and crayfish. Now, so now we go to, to I think, Vigneau, Ribeiro, uh, with... Uh, I hope we actually to speak to spend a little bit more time on this. It's a very interesting wine. And this is for some of you, I think, may be quite new because um, these Ribeiro wines, Trecidura, are perhaps not so familiar as Alvarino. Before, before we go that far, let me just, there was a, a question that was asked. How would we um, expect these wines to age? And perhaps Fuste oh. can answer that. Fuste, ¿cuánto yeah. tiempo? I can't indeed, no, ¿cuánto tiempo pueden durar? De, 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 ¿Cómo se...? De, de, evolución en los vinos con tiempo. ¿Cuánto tiempo se pueden guardar? Estos vinos se mantendrían en plenitud tres años como mínimo. En plenitud. Sí. It will be at its peak, at its peak for another three years. I think when you are 2019. And then you can see what happens. But it's got, it will be shown as it is today for another three years um, without any problem. That's at, 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 at its plenitud, at, at its peak. Can we move on to the Finca Vignola, please? Yeah, okay, pues sí. Finca Vignola, volvemos otra vez al color. Vemos que tiene un... O repetimos, pero es que es, la, es tal cual. Una intensidad colorante eh, con unos notas verdes aceradas, muy brillante, muy limpio, muy, eh, un vino muy cuidado. Yes, it's a very clean, uh, intense, bright wine. Again, these steely green... Uh, uh, hints to in, in the color, but uh, brilliancy and brightness main features. El vino en nariz vuelve a ser un vino frutal, intenso, un aroma intenso y frutal. ¿Eh? So an intense fruit, fruit uh, nose without without stirring the glass. 
y la nota predominante es manzana, pera, aparecen notas de fruta de hueso y también notas de vegetales. Ok, now you're getting more uh, apple and pear predominant on the nose. Some of this uh, stone fruit, stone fruit too, and then more sort of uh, herbaceous aromas. Es un vino muy intenso, muy complejo, eh, muy elegante en nariz. Intent, complex and, and elegant on the nose. This is a wine that uh, when, you, when you have people over for dinner, if you really enjoy it and have the kind of food that it goes with, you can amaze all your friends. With <laughs> well, ask them where it, you mean ask them where it comes from, Howard? <laughs> And the point is that when people come to my house, they never expect to get a wine they've ever heard of. <laughs> and, and, the, and that's a good thing. When people come to your house and you want to entertain and show them the food that you do and how much you care about the, the effort that you made to make the dinner, you also want to show them how much effort you made in picking out the wine. So the, the idea about how we talk about these things and the flavors that are involved, it's to help you figure out what they go with. That is the most important question. I, I love wine by itself. I almost never think of it with food because when I taste it professionally, I always drink it by itself. So I can remember what it tastes like and pick out the food. But I guarantee you that if you pick up any seafood dish instead of a very light one, all three of these wines will be enjoyable. And um, just as long as you don't serve them ice cold. Big problem. Okay, Roger, sorry. No, carry on. Come on. See you. Oh, Steve. Dime. No, take see you. Boca es un vino muy elegante, con una muy buena entrada y un muy buen equilibrio, un buen balance entre la acidez y las notas dulzonas de las monoproteínas, de las lías, del trabajo de lías. Y es un vino también con una mineralidad, pero una mineralidad distinta a las anteriores. Es una mineralidad que no es salina, sino que es una mineralidad eh, que nos viene de la, de, de la acidez, de la descomposición granítica, de los suelos que tenemos en Finca Viñoa. Y es un vino muy redondo y muy persistente en boca y, de, y que, que resalto fundamentalmente el equilibrio y el aroma de boca, que nos recuerda sí. francamente... Uh, lo que percibimos, uh, and, and in the, in the in the mouth, he's emphasizing the great balance uh, Finkibonyar has between the, the the acidity, but also the, these other qualities, the the, the the fruit and also the mineral aspect, which um, Jose was just linking there also to the vineyard, as I, as I tried to explain in, in the presentation. You you have um, perhaps more of a, of a, a mineral aspect to Finkibonyar, which you can do directly relate to the sabrigal and the schist uh, in, in the soil, the mineral content of the soil, but, but well balanced, a, a great balance to the wine and a, and a, and a very full, interesting uh, mouthfeel and, and the, the, the lease aspect to uh, other components in, in, the, in, the, in the mouth. Y un vino con, con esta estructura y con esta fuerza, con este poderío, me lleva a un maridaje con un arroz con borradante o, o, o un besugo al horno. O sea, dos bocados potentes, hablando de, tanto de marisco como tal, pero a dos, eh, a dos platos potentes con que, que maridarían fenomenalmente con este vino. Bueno, esto va muy bien con with, with, with powerful dishes too. Es un vino que dice que se va a pair con un uh, lobster, pero este es un lobster en el tipo de risotto, es un lobster rice dish, pero con un muy strong flavors and then uh, a, a baked fish dish which also uh, basugo where you again uh, looking at um, a, a strong uh, uh, intense flavors uh, in the dish so it, it pairs well with, with these you know these big uh, delicious meals with uh, flavors and uh, and a wine i think you have to say is is a uh, it's very emblematic of, of the what's now happening in in, in ribeiro it's wines like think of you are going back to the, the, the past, the recovery of the vineyards, planting Treshadura, which has created sort of a, a new wave in the region, which is uh, drawing uh, attention more and more uh, to a place which people had, you know, perhaps associated more with the past than the present and, and also now the future. But it's so uh, uh, people sometimes perhaps not aware of 
of all that's going on in Ribeiro, they, they, they think about its history uh, more than its, its present and, and future. But uh, think of it, you know, and these wines, I think you have to look at as part of a, a new wave that's going on uh, linked to this recovery of old vineyards, replanting with varieties like Trechadura, and, and really trying to sort of uh, create a, a renaissance in, in the region, of which Costa, I have to say, is, is, a, is a pioneer because he started this 20 years ago. Um, people have joined the, 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 um, the, the show since. But uh, uh, they one of the first to really get this this new this new trend this new wave going. Good. Cualquier cuestión o cualquier impresión que quieran compartir. Yes, I know we've used up a lot of time, but if there's any questions, uh, please. Now is uh, uh, the time. Okay. Hi, Roger. We did have one question earlier. Um, oh, I so missed that. No, no, it's okay. It came in in the chat. Um, we answered the question about you know the could these wines age? Um, and uh, you said up to three years. And well, well three years at, it, it's at its peak. Uh, what and happens it, after uh, is, you know, it will carry on, but you might see it change. But three years uh, from where it is now, it won't, uh, it, it will it will stay where it is. Let's put it that way. Okay. Stay, stay. Great, awesome. So we have that. And then the other question was for, um, for you today. So we have, your glass appears to be bigger than what we would use for <laughs> wine here in the US. Is there an advantage to using a larger glass? Um, and you know, can, can you talk more about that? Yes, uh, Alguien ha dicho que, que tu copo es mucho más grande que, que el suyo y, y pregunta si hay ventajas en tener una copa pues, más amplia, más grande. Para... Eh, la, la forma de la copa, la forma de la copa y también la amplitud de, de lo que es el cáliz es muy importante para a la hora de percibir los Yes, it's very important, isn't it? especially when you're looking at the, the, the shape and the size of the, of the cup is important, particularly when you want to enjoy uh, the aromas of the wine. Una buena copa de cristal siempre transmite muchísimo mejor las sensaciones y es un amplificador eh, importante a la hora de hacer una carta o una demostración de un vino. Es yes, muy importante. Like, una no, buena copa. Yes, sorry, put on Y para los, vinos, para los vinos aromáticos es importante que la copa tenga un buen balón, tenga un buen cáliz. Yes, he says it's, it's a bit like an, an amplifier of the wine. It's, it, it's important to invest in a, in a, in a good uh, glass, crystal glass with the, this shape and form, because it does have an amplifying effect, particularly with the uh, aromas of a wine. Um, so it, it's, it's an important component of a, of a tasting. En definitiva, no es tan importante eh, lo grande que sea la copa, sino la forma que tiene, sobre todo la forma que tiene el cáliz y eh, la calidad del vidrio. Yes, I mean, it's, it's also not so much perhaps the actual physical size as the, as the shape. You know, this has this sort of a calyx shape with a, 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 with a, with a sort of, a, yeah, like almost like a, a, a tulip. And then the quality of the glass itself. So that the form and, the, and it's ideally a crystal, crystal glass uh, is the, the, the most important features. It doesn't have to be a, enormous, but the right size, but the shape and the quality of the glass. Great, thank okay. you. That's okay. what we're doing. We're gonna we're gonna have to hurry along here. <laughs> okay, we all like to talk. I'm telling you, it's it's a tribute to how we are as wine salesmen. We never stop talking. Okay, <laughs> Jose and uh, Roger, thank you so much. It's really okay. important for people to see where all of this comes from and to talk about the way the wine is made to be able to really enjoy it. And I hope everyone did. I love the wine. I, I think they all go tremendously well with, with the kind of seafood that all of us enjoy. It doesn't have to be expensive seafood. It doesn't even have to be American seafood. It can be even sushi. It can be uh, Asian menus that it would work with, with pasta, with all the kinds of things. We don't want to limit this to, um, to Spanish food. So thanks again. And Roger, I'll talk to you soon again. And thank you, stay for me, OK? All right. So now we are talking very quickly <laughs> about uh, Rivera del Duero, um, and we'll move forward with this. Uh, Rivera del Duero is a, a, a DO, another DO that appears in the um, uh, autonomous community of Castilla León. Castilla León 
is, uh, do I have a map here? Let me see. I do have a map. Here we go. Rivera del Duero is here, surrounded by the uh, uh, Sistema Guadarrama and the Iberico Mountains here. And you can see that. Again, it's a river valley. If you would go there, you would see this stream that runs through the valley. But in the middle of the valley, you would see these um, I look like islands. They're mountains, but they were originally islands in the middle of the of the river, which at that point was very wide and very deep. Okay, so here we are in the in the deal itself of Rivera del Duero. The best of it stretches from here in Aranda de Duero all the way west to here. Quintanilla de Onésimo um, along the River Duero. Um, and in that area, 19,500 hectares, which includes about 30,000 acres, 800 growers. This, with these figures are old, but there are even more now. Only 215 wineries, and the altitude is from 2,100 to 2,700 feet. It's very high and subject to frost, subject to all the problems that accrue when you go to uh, high elevations. Rivera del Duero wines, just two hours directly north of Madrid, on the uh, running west for just about an hour along the N122. I say that because it's just like Napa, which runs north south on Route 1, I think it is. High elevation from 2100 to 2700 feet. The average read of, uh, yield about 6,000 kilos. A kilo is 2.2 pounds, so you can judge from there we're talking about. 12,000, 14,000, 15,000 pounds uh, as a maximum yield. The soils are mostly limestone or clay. And the good news for them is that the day night, the diurnal temperatures are very different. So it allows the heat of the day to cool down at night and makes a difference for the wine. The, the grapes are grown in Basso or in Espaldera along wires. Only Tempranillo is allowed for red wines in uh, Rivera del Duero. Only Tempranillo, one grape. You can, no new planting, if, if, you, ha if you bought a vineyard and it had Mer uh, Merlot in it or Malbec, you could use that grape, but otherwise, no. The white is one grape, Alber Albio. Robert Parker once called a winery in Pescara del Duero, one of the regions, sub-regions, the Petrus of Spain, which immediately uh, Red led to this huge increase in the number of bodegas and people's interest in the wine. Um, here is that area of Spain called, uh, this is Peña Fiel, in the heart of the region. This is a, a crusader castle that was meant to keep out the Moors. And you can see here the, the Embaso vines. Right. Um, the, I just wanted to get the, you to be able to see what they look like. These are older wines, as you can tell from the thickness of the of the of the uh, roots. All right, Bodegas Truce is what we'll be tasting. Truce is an acronym for Tierra, Roble, Uvas, and Sol. Tierra is the land, of course. Roble is the oak that's used. Uvas grapes, and Sol the sun. When this winery was founded in 1999, it was thought through before the first grape vine was planted. And Pesquero de Duero was chosen for the vineyards and the location is within the Golden Mile. This was an area that was delineated by Francis Robinson, uh, a famed British writer, as one of the best, if not the best, um, sub-regions of Ribeiro del Duero. Um, the vineyards around the winery, which you'll see shortly, are divided into estates, larger portions, into parcels within those estates, and into areas of similar soil and microclimate and even to particular vine groups of similar characteristics. So the people who own this winery have gone as far as they can go to get the best out of the grapes that they grow. They have 60 hectares. A hectare is two and a half acres approximately into 14 parcels within a radius of two kilometers from the winery. The yield is 3,000 kilos and uh, per hectare. So we're talking about 6,000 uh, 7,500 pounds, okay? A kilo being approximately two, five pounds, uh, excuse me, 2.2 pounds. And growing approximately five pounds per vine, which means that 
they can only produce one bottle per vine. One bottle per vine. Think about that. When you reduce the yield, you take all of the effort of the plant, instead of into 20 bunches of grapes, into two bunches of grapes. And that makes all the difference. Okay? So if you want to pour that wine, the wine into your glass, by all means do that now, okay? While we're talking about it. The vines that are used to make this um, roble, meaning roble means just a little bit of oak, in this case, four months in oak, whereas older, older wines, Crianza, Reserva, Grand Reserva, are, uh, are wines that are aged longer in oak. 15 to 20 year old Tempranillo vines, only Tempranillo. The initial uh, fermentation occurs in concrete vats for 10 days using indigenous yeast. It's not yeast that are manufactured and put into the wines. They come off the, the grapes, um, so they, that's what they use. Um, the soil is um, implemented by using manure, esterical, I think they call it, manure. That's it. There's no other effort put into the soil to change it. Barrel aging in four months in French and American oak, young and old oak. So it, it depends on the vintage and the winemaker's choice about which uh, is used to make the wine uh, come out as they would like it. Softer, lighter touch than Crianza, the older wine, brighter fruit flavors, complex, intense nose. This is what happens with these younger vines. They like to, um, so why don't you taste it, see what you think. Um, I, I, I decanted mine about four hours ago to help get it at the point at which I'd like to taste it. And the first thing you'll notice is the color. It's a very deep black wine with edges of, of light purple, which is significant of younger vines, okay? Uh, when I say to look at the color, you're also looking at whether there's anything floating in the vine. That happens, not often, but it does. So here we go. I hope you'll taste it and enjoy it. Think about the foods that it goes with, even hamburgers, down to that level. Howard, while everyone is pouring, I do have a question. Someone wants to know specifically what type of manure is used in uh, the vineyards here? It's probably bull manure, cattle. That's about all that's raised in Spain, um, cattle. Um, and um, that's probably what they use. Um, they also plow back into the soil some of the vines to add that. To the to the um, to the soil to enrich it, but nothing else. There's no chemicals added. These wines are typically, in, including the the wines that could be considered um, uh, what I want the, the phrase um, organic, because nothing that isn't organic is used in the soil. But that takes an incredible amount of, of uh, paperwork to get that done, and they choose not to go through it, so they don't call it organic but the elaboration of the wine is all organic. Barrel aging for four months. And this wine is a wine that probably will still stay well for the next five or six or seven years. Um, now it is rich in spice and oak, a little bit of oak, lots of earth and uh, even a mineral contact to it. Again, it goes wonderfully with um, uh, meats, of course. Um, stew, even, um, I would say even you could use this with um, bluefish if you grilled it. And uh, now that I'm, I'm pressed for time, we'll have to go from, any questions about Roberto del Duero or, the, or what we're talking about here? Okay. All right, I was going to say, Howard, we'll also, we can also at the very end, as people are enjoying their wine now, we Right at the very end, we can um, see if anyone else has more questions and stuff, because I know we're going okay. through time, but it's being recorded, so I can always, I'll share the recording with everyone, so anyone who misses any bit will get to watch it later. Sorry to run over, but, you know, when it comes to Spain and wines, I talk a lot, and so does Roger, it's important to us. Now we come to uh, my efforts. Over the past 10 years, I have taken, I, I was a glutton for punishment. I take 20 people to Spain in September every year for two weeks. 
um, because I wanted to share what I love about Spain and the wines and the people and the food with other people from this country. Oh. Were you Are they swollen? Yes, go ahead. No, actually, they're, they're not really, except for my big toes that have the bunions. Yeah, they were always so are a mess, but now my, my fear and, and I'm missing some, somebody's asking a question I can't understand. Um, if you were trying to ask a question, please write it in the chat. And uh, Howard, I would say keep, keep going on and then we'll get to that question at the end. Okay, so um, this is a two week tour, two weeks on the ground, actually. Um, it started off with, uh, amazingly different. Now it's morphed into something a lot more courageous and, and uh, more professional. But most people will land in Madrid and fly from Madrid to Santiago de Compostela here in, the, in, the, in Galicia. Uh, we do a tour in, Gal in Santiago, a guided tour of the cathedral in Santiago. And then we stay in, uh, right in Rosal, actually, in Bayona, which is this incredible corridor on its own peninsula. It used to be a castle, and now it's a, it's a parador. From there, we go to um, the town that Roger was talking about, Rivadavia, which is in Orense province. It's about 60 miles inland. And, and we have a, a lunch and a wine tasting there, and we tour the vineyards, etc. They have a 400-year-old farmhouse, which they have uh, turned into an inn. Um, and the food that they give us is, they, I've known these people for 20 years. I've grown up with their, their children have grown up with me. They're a very special family. From there, this is the longest bus ride that we have. It's uh, to Leon, where there's an incredible cathedral, which you're welcome to visit and which we provide a tour of. Um, and great food. It is the heart of Castilla. Okay. We move north from there. It's about an hour to uh, Comillas. Comillas. Comillas is, is a town where uh, Gaudí built this summer home for somebody, which has turned into this incredible um, site to visit. Uh, from there, about another hour to Bilbao. Uh, Bilbao, we stay for three nights, I think, two or three nights anyway. We are in a hotel which is directly across the street from the uh, uh, Guggenheim Museum. So you can see it from your room or from the, the, the restaurants that they have there. And during that time there, you visit San Sebastian over here to the right, which um, uh, has this incredible town, which has its own can, uh, film festival and some of the best seafood in the world. Mugaritz, one of the top restaurants in the world is located there. And here just south of Bilbao, is a restaurant called Pasadora Chabari, which we have gone to for the last four years, which is um, number three in the world. I forgot to say back here in Galicia, in a little village called Cambados, is a restaurant called uh, Yayo de Porta, which is, at, Yayo is the nickname of the, of the chef. In, in Spanish, it is Cinero, cooker. And we have lunch there as well. So we have lunch at uh, a four hour lunch at, at Chabari. We visit San Sebastian, and if there's time, on the Rivia, along just at the border with France, then we travel to Rioja. Rioja is the only region, only DO in Spain, which is also a province. There's the province of La Rioja and the DO of Rioja. Interesting uh, little tidbit of fact. We go for, and we visit wineries there, of course. We stay in a town called Aro in an old, uh, hotel which used to be a, a, a prison. We go from there to um, Burgos. Burgos is the heart of Castilla León and it is, um, we stay in this incredible hotel called NH, right, right uh, half, you know, half a block from the center of the town. From there to um, uh, um, Rueda. Rueda is white wine. Um, and a Verdejo grape. And we visit with um, uh, the vineyard there and have a little tasting and, and lunch. From there down to um, Sugonovia. We, we take lunch there because we used to arrive in Madrid 
too early and have to wait around for the hotel to, to take our, our reservation. But now we spend a couple hours there, we have lunch, a little visit, and on to Madrid. And in Madrid, we stay with um, at the Wellington Hotel, one of these incredible um, old hotels with tapestries and French furniture, excuse me, Spanish, of course, French <laughs> furniture, etc. Now, this is uh, a little paragraph that I put together for the wine tour in the, in the, in the uh, brochure. But um, I, I couldn't help but put out the whole thing. I have put together a tour because I'm an English major. When I write something that's really cool, I, I like to have the whole thing. I put together a tour that is much more than a time to take pictures and walk through Crane Towns. It is a tour where you will be invited into a world of very special people who have created extraordinary wine. You will experience Spanish cuisine at its freshest and its most amazing settings. And you will visit some of the world's most astounding cathedrals and exquisite galleries. There will also be time for quiet walks on your own, dining experiences to savor by yourselves, a rich tapestry encounters in every village and large city. Touring your own at your own pace with suggestions from Antonio and me will help you get the, the most from your experiences in a very personal way. Anybody who wants to applaud that, you can, you're welcome to do that. <laughs> um, here's some pictures. This is uh, Bodegas de Alduero, where we have lunch and a grand tasting in the Finca, the ranch. This is the ranch house up here on the hill. The owner of this vineyard used to be a um, uh, an engineer, a civil engineer. So what he did was to create this hill from nothing. He built this hill, which is about 60 feet high. It's all dirt. And underneath the dirt are the tunnels where the barrels are and the fermenting tanks and the wine storage. So it's a constant temperature all year long. These are the vines that are owned by the winery. This is the tasting that we have at the winery. And this is very cool. In San Sebastian, do this tapas class where everyone gets a chance to make their own tapas. Very, very much fun and enjoy them. And then we have lunch afterwards. And finally, this is Bodegas Truce and the vineyards that surround it. This is a little village called uh, Onderibia. It's a tapas bar, but it could be created in any city that we visit. This is Bodegas Cachinha, which makes chocolate, which we visit when we go to San Sebastian. And this, this grill restaurant that they have there, aside from making great chocolate, because they only do one wine, is um, one of the top 50 in the world. This is the uh, winery at uh, Cusedo. And these vats are the distillation vats for the, um, the uh, uh, aguardiente that they make. This is the cellar at uh, Pablo Los Campanianos that we visit in uh, Ribera del Duero. And this, the village of um, Bajuaria, which we visit in Rioja. And I think that's it. <laughs> I hope you're not applauding, but <laughs> you're wishing to do more. And um, for me, it's a very special thing. So I hope that you all enjoy this. Sorry to run longer by about 35 minutes. <laughs> Next, we'll know better <laughs> than this, and we'll do it faster. But thanks for your time. Thanks for paying attention, your questions. And I really appreciate it. This is an issue. I've been in the business for over 50 years, 50 years. And uh, every year has been exciting for me and enjoyable. I met some incredible people in wonderful parts of the world. It's been a great business to be in. Thanks. Thanks very much. Okay. And I see some people, Sandy Hoxter and some others that I know, um, Bill Burke and uh, Jim Bridges and my wife and uh, some others that I know. And uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it because I know in this tour, just as a, a way of saying how much people enjoyed it, I've had people come back two and three times the same tour with little nuances of differences. That's how much people enjoyed 
this tour. We spent a lot more time, a lot less time together and a lot more time uh, apart so that you can enjoy this thing on your own, okay? That's the, that's the end. Thank you again. Thank you, Kim, for arranging all this. And buy some, for God's sake. You know, that's how you can show how much you enjoy it. <laughs> yes, exactly. And, you know, I just want to say um, thank you so much, Howard, for putting this together, putting the presentation together. It has been really amazing to, uh, to listen. And also, I just wanted to note that in the chat, we have added... Um, Howard's wine tour website. You can click on it and take a look at his wow. tour. And I'll also send an email about this too. And then if you really loved any of these specific bottles, they were all great. But if you want to just get some more, um, Calvert Woodley has them on sale. And so I dropped in the link for that as well. And I'll follow up with an email so you'll have all of that information. But, um, you know, big thank you from Calvert Woodley to Howard. And if anyone has any questions, uh, we can um, feel free to email me. Um, or Howard, I can include his email in a in a in, in my email so that you all can reach out to him um, with any questions. But big thank you to everyone here. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Everybody. Have a good night. Bye.